Welcome to a special Saturday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 714. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's January 30th, 2022. All right, for those of you who follow us on Facebook, you read sometime during the middle of the week that George says he's sick. And George was sick, and he's still getting over being sick, but he has been down for the whole week, and but he really wanted to record a program. He says, we've got to get this news out, Kevin, and he's just being the Walter Conkright of Anglicanism. So all right, I, said, I said, George, let's do it. We'll get this, uh, get this taped and stuff like that. But we want the audience to have patience because ordinarily we forget names, places, and dates already. Imagine doing a show like this, unscripted, and you know having a head cold or you know COVID or whatever flu you have so we want to just let the audience know up front george is wearing headphones because his ears hurt fine nothing wrong with that he's wearing a suit to look good to to convince you that you know hey everything's okay but if during the show you see george kind of just to, to off camera we're going to keep recording because he'll keep talking it'll be fine don't worry hey. <laughs> it's the and you know sometimes codeine sometimes codeine does strange yeah, things for people. Yeah. Well, you had uh, a really bad cough. You know, you you have the the gunk part of the cold. Um, but did you did you test yourself? Do you have COVID? Well, the I've test was tested three times because mm-hmm. I had all the COVID symptoms: uh, fever, chills, body aches, eyes red rimmed, uh, coughing, no smell. Um, and each time it came back negative. In the last test, I received the results this morning. Uh, the first two were home tests. That And the GP tells me that uh, I may just have the flu. I may just have a very mild case of COVID plus the flu. Or I may not be sticking the swab far up and up my nose. But the w- whatever the case may be, the treatment is what the doctors prescribe for all the COVID patients. And so for the fir- first time in a very long time, I will not be celebrating church tomorrow. Mm. Um, this, uh, even when I would go on vacation to the Caribbean, I do, I go on vacation by going and serving at a church. And I've not done the daily offices this week uh, from the chapel here. And I just feel Something's missing in my life. Um, you know, here's a funny. Now, they're what are they're what we call liturgy Nazis, uh, who are the really odd people who love liturgy for the sake of liturgy. Correct. Yes. I'm not. I'm not one of those. Yeah. I'm a worship. Maybe not a worship. Not not a worship Nazi, but a worship nut. I really feel wonderful, and much better in my life, and with the discipline of daily worship and. And that's all gone out the door because I'm I'm like a baby. I'm pink. I'm I'm constantly going to the bathroom, and I'm awake for out two hours and sleep for two hours. So once again, audience, have patience, but also pray for George and his recovery. Uh, I'm stuck up here in Connecticut, uh, where we used to live near Milford, because we decided to keep our doctors here in Connecticut because it's part of the Yale system and. They're the best of the best, unless you want dermatology or cataracts, you can do that down in, in, in Florida. And so we flew up here during the, the Nor'easter because it's also impossible during COVID times to get an appointment. We didn't want to have to reschedule and wait another three or four months. So I had some dental work done and Jill had some women girl uh, tests done and stuff like that. And now we're all healthy back and we're going to fly back to uh, Florida on Monday and you know, life should go back to normal as long as we don't get hit in the head by falling, falling iguanas, which is uh, something that happens in Florida. During the colder months, I got my falling iguana uh, text alert from Bushnell, Florida. And I thought, George, you've been there longer. What is a falling iguana? Well, somebody years ago got a pet iguana, or maybe had two of them in Miami. Mm-hmm. 
Do you have roosters yeah, in there? No, that's the blizzard. If you hear that whistling, <laughs> that whistling wind, I'm up against a big picture window, which is you know my light source right now, and I'm watching snow and swirling, and I see the the uh, Mexican crew trying to clear the sidewalk, and then there's a little snowball. So I'll show you that video here, but you know, it, so please just be patient with the show. I have issues in Connecticut. George has issues in Florida. Continue with the iguana. Somebody brought some pet iguanas and let them loose in Miami in the 70s. And they have gradually colonized South Florida. And iguanas, uh, being lizards, are have blood temperature based on the outside temperature. And when it falls below 40 degrees, iguanas that live in trees will basically stop moving and in a stiff breeze will fall out of the tree. And iguanas, uh, down in Miami especially, where there are a lot of them, will dent your car or uh, fall into your swimming pool. And, 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 so they won't, you, and they won't die. They'll get up a couple hours later when it warms up and they'll walk away. Yeah, walk away. <laughs> now, we don't have them here, Kevin. Um, mm -hmm. You're probably, you're south of me, so you may be at the line because they're steadily marching north. But we have, uh, around here and down where you are, we have coyotes. Sure. We have panther, Florida, Florida the black panthers. Panther. Yeah. And uh, we have bears. Um, we have more bears up here than down there. So uh, <laughs> the, the, and the bears are a tasty supplement. Uh, iguanas are a tasty supplement to a bear's diet. Sure. As they are to coyotes. Uh, coyotes actually live on small cats. Uh, so if whiskey and rye cause any trouble, leave them out one night, and that's what'll happen. They'll be gone the next day. Um, but All right. so, uh, friends, it, and you know, and actually, I'd let you know that is co considered a comprehensive insurance claim if you have an iguana fall on your car and break the windshield or dent. Sure. Well, and that's why Florida has no fault insurance. You know, you you get paid either way. All right, let's move on to the news. There's, uh, here's what we're doing. You know, because we're taping late in the week and we're going to still tape on Tuesday, we're saving uh, some things for Tuesday. We're going to talk a lot about the, the Pittsburgh Bishop no nominees on Tuesday. But there's some other stuff we need to catch up from last week that we never got to report on that's very important. And the first uh, story we're going to talk about is certainly going to be uh, a church for the sake of others, uh, led by Bishop Todd Hunter you will probably know in the news recently that uh, Christ Church Plano left that diocese uh, to, to help with the formation of an, uh, another diocese um, in, in Texas. And I thought, you know, it's a great time now that we have more stories to report on uh, Church for the Sake of Others that we can do so. And we've been getting rumors that some churches within that diocese no longer want to be affiliated with the ACNA. And that we also heard there was a discussion and a, uh, um, what's it called, at the convention where they put forth, a resolution was put forward. <laughs> Jeez, George, I'm not the one that should be having the memory problems. You should. Uh, a resolution was put forward where they take the uh, submission to the ACNA canons out of their bylaws as a diocese. George, I, I, I forward all the information to you. You were sick. What have we found out? That I'm still sick. Uh, <laughs> okay, yes, Kevin, you're right. We've been getting emails for a few weeks now mm -hmm. asking about a secret March conclave of the House of College of Bishops to deal with the C4SO problem. And we've asked on the record and off the record and, and basically being told, well, it's not a secret that the bishops meet fairly re frequently. And it's not a secret that there are some people who are upset with the direction C4SO is taking. So we've had a denial, non-denial, or confirmation, non-confirmation, that there is talk at the bishop's level. So what are all the things that are going on? Well, the Reformed Episcopal Church in particular is upset about some of the theological uh, ideas percolating from the C4SO clergy and leadership critical race theory, some of the more uh, loosey-goosey stuff on human sexuality. Um, well, yeah, looking towards human justice and not God justice, looking towards wokeism and not uh, Galatianism. You know, it's, yeah, there's a, a lot going on. And 
in this and, diocese that we, you know we've we've kind of referred to in the past that they're kind of the the I, I'm going to use the word liberal fringe of the ACNA if you if you want to use terms like that. Well, and the REC is uh, pretty strong in its foundations and beliefs, and they basically want to. It's not so much of a showdown, but we need to sort of get, be all on the same page because we don't want to go the Episcopal route of whatever floats your boat, man's fine. So now, are the bishops going to meet to discuss C4SO? Well, a lot of the conversation that they've been having in the past at their meeting recently in Melbourne has been about the upper Midwest situation. So this is not going to push that out of the picture any day now but and with the covid uh crisis coming in and going out we can't say when a meeting will be held in person but yes there are concerns now what's the other side of so that's concerns from outside the c4so that that we have heard voiced most vigorously by the rec well uh, with, if i we posted an article by ray sutton who denounced critical race theory uh, in an article on Anglican.inc, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, yes. it, it's it's very easy to denounce critical race theory. Um, it is a heresy in the church, and wokeism mm -hmm. is a heresy in the church. But oddly enough, it's if you can become accidentally Anglican, you can certainly become an accidental heretic. And we want to be sure that we we identify what the heresies are and what the differences are between the gospel and critical race theory, which Ray Sutton did well. And if the ACNA needs to deal with this at a diocesan level or in the Episcopate level, what are their choices, George? Well, see, it's been made difficult because Todd Hunter has been on the record saying, well, nobody can really tell us what to do. These, th these statements on human sexuality are more like weather advisories warning us of a, a hard frost tonight rather than this is the Nicene Creed, which you must recite at every service. Now, that's not how the some of the bishops view their statements. They don't view them as good advice. They view them as the uh, considered wisdom and faith received by the leaders of this church. So what's happening? Well, Todd Hunter is sort of in a tough position because He's got to stand facing out to critics from outside his diocese. Well, within his diocese, I had one fellow, very nice viewer, uh, thank you, uh, send me a list of, I think it was 10 or a dozen parishes in or, or ecclesial units uh, who have sort of quietly dropped the ACNA from their website. Now, whether they have or have a single webmaster who did this uh, on his own, or whether there is just disquiet amongst a certain section of C4SO that they want to be don't want to be identified with the ACNA, I don't know. But we're seeing that happening. And as Kevin mentioned, um, at the November uh, diocesan convention of C4SO. Uh, which we've both reviewed the videotape. It was kindly placed on the internet. Uh, difficult to find, but you can find it if you look for it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they've done is uh, canonical uh, changes. They've sort of cleaned up their act. And uh, Bishop Todd Hunter, um, well, he had a bit of a Freudian slip in the introduction. He said, 2022 will be a time when we rethink our allegiances. And so no, not 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 our allegiance. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, yeah, it was something uh, else. Well, yeah. Something else. But you know, at that moment, your your eyes open wide, and even COVID fog is cleared. And then we had Myron Steves, who's the chancellor of the uh, C4SO, say we've had some canonical revisions and changes. And we have an Episcopal church-like structure where we have a small constitution with then a big bunch of canons. And we've been trying to make sure that we don't have duplication with the ACNA's provincial canons 
and we don't have things that are in conflict because if there's a case of conflict, the province outranks the diocese. And so we've had all these changes that we've spent months soliciting opinions about and receiving information from people. And we then sent them to Phil Ashey, the chancellor of the ACNA, for review. Friend of Anglican Unscripted, a great worker with the ACNA, a great worker with the international relationships of the Anglican Union, a, somebody who would be in the know because he is the canon here for the ACNA. And, and uh, Steve's, Myron Steve's said, and Phil got back to us and said, there's one change, and we've made that change. And, so, and the voting was basically for in favor of all these changes. Well, one of our viewers, actually two, we got it from two sources, I think. I, I can't think straight, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I looked at it on a, a Safari browser and a yes, Chrome sir. browser, so that's two, two. Okay, the A C four Canon S O Canon yeah. one. When you say C four, Kevin, I just think of explosives. I I'm do sorry. Too. Uh, and I kept calling him Tab Hunter instead oh, of Todd Tab Hunter. Hunter, Hunter in there. No. So, yeah. so my brain is not firing on all cylinders, like the Mercedes. <laughs> but uh, the uh, Canon one which sort of defines the diocese place within the Anglican world, the original draft had taken away its statement that we are part of the Anglican Church in North America, and instead stated that we are a part of, uh, we are clergy, congregations, institutions affiliated with the wider Anglican communion. So that was, the ACNA bit was dropped well, the final rev revision, which was adopted by the convention, had the ACNA language back in, but in a slightly different form. So I wrote to Phil Ashey and I said, Phil, uh, was it by any chance, was this the question that you said they had to clean up their act? Now, Myron Steves explained that we wanted to make sure we didn't have duplications and we didn't have things that uh, were not necessary because they had already been stated by the ACNA. So maybe one charitable view is that, well, they just, from a cleaning up and getting rid of the verbiage, they just thought they'd, everybody knows we're part of the ACNA, we're just re reaffirming we're part of the Anglican Communion. Or was there a push, just like we have 10 parishes, to pull them out of the ACNA and go mm -hmm. their own way and pursue the social justice uh, gospel. So uh, Phil got back to me. So, oh, it's my wife's birthday this weekend. Happy birthday! And, yeah. and <laughs> let me let let me check my notes, and I'll get back to you next week. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So we cannot assume bad things. We cannot. We just can assume what took place, and what took place was the C four S O affirmed its place in the A C N A. Now, sort of the fun little question was, what little dance took place between the beginning and the end of this journey? And uh, was it Phil Ashey who said, you can't do this? Well, it, it's going to be interesting to watch you know, when we finally get in contact with Phil about you know what happened at his level. But I, I want to remind people why we're in this position. There is an ACNA because there was no accountability to the bishops of the Episcopal Church. And there was no accountability to the diocese of the Episcopal Church. So a bishop could go rogue and not be held accountable by the, the House of Bishops. A diocese could go rogue and not be held accountable by 815 or anybody else. And the ACNA was formed in its bylaws and canons to have a, in a, a little bit of accountability at the, the College of Bishops level and a little bit of accountability at the diocesan level so that we can't have a rogue diocese start preaching heresy without being corrected and, and a nice soft correction. Stop. You probably didn't know about critical race theory. That's, that's, that's heresy. Here we can show you in scripture. We can show you through anthropology. We can show you through uh, uh, 
all the different uh, uh, muses and sciences we have where it is off the rails. Now, you know, we need to we need to also say that uh, maybe our perspective is askew because of, there are other things, other factors. Um, we mentioned that the Todd Atkinson and the Upper Midwest uh, issues have been in forefront of the College of Bishops, especially at the Melbourne meeting, and in their online communications. Mm -hmm. And the Upper Midwest uh, issue, there's a group out there called ACNA2, T-O-O, -O, then a hashtag. And they have been advocates for the victims, and they've been quite strong in their condemnation of the Upper Midwest's handling they have become um, activists within yes. this horrible situation, yes. And the leadership of ACNA2, according to their website, are made up of probably half of them are members of C4SO congregations. Mm -hmm. So are these 10 ecclesial units who are distancing themselves from the ACNA are they doing it because they wish to pursue social justice and racial equality? Or are they embarrassed by the upper Midwest problem? In other words, is it a theological issue or is it a marketing issue? But then let's throw in another little thing. Todd Hunter on December 15th announced that the dean of the Midwest of C4SO, Jay Greener, had been suspended pending an investigation into misconduct. And now this letter to the clergy which we've been given, um, basically says that we don't really talk about these things, but then he goes on to talk about it. And he reaffirms the C4SO support for victims, which if I were Jay Greener, I'd be a little pissed off because it's presupposing guilt. Um, we have 1,200 years of good <clears throat> understanding of guilt is not, or, or you can't as, uh, assume accusation is guilt. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we've developed our laws, we had the Magna Carta, we've come a long, long, long way where we're in 2021, we know not to, especially with first reports and everything else, automatically assume because you've been accused you're guilty. That That's wrong. Yeah, and, you know, Guilty and proven innocent is one of the things that we're fighting in this woke world of political correctness and cancel Innocent culture. until proven guilty. You, you, you got it, yeah. No, no, I'm saying the woke culture okay, is right. telling us that you're guilty yes, until and unless you're proven innocent. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, so we're seeing sort of this mindset come into the church, which goes back to the original entry point into this discussion, which is the REC saying, stop, you know, Theologically, culturally, uh, we think you guys are not quite on the same page as we are. So fans of Anglican Scripted certainly know about Monty Python and their movie, The Holy Grail. Monty Python's The Holy Grail. And in there, there's a great scene where the main character uh, is going to kill a white rabbit, and he can do that by tossing a hand grenade. Well, not just any hand grenade, a holy hand grenade. And we know the Church of England and the Church of the Roman oh, Churches had made oh, objects man. holy, which right. may or may not be holy. One, and we read, two, thanks to George, five, posting three, the story, that three. there's a holy tea tray. I don't know if you have to put the holy hand grenade on the holy tea tray or drink the tea before you take... I'm sure there's an explanation, so let's talk about the holy tea tray of the Church of England. Well, Eric Idle and uh, Michael Palin can tell us which chapter from the Book of Armaments yes. <laughs> the uh, Holy Hand Grenade is. There's a uh, there's an abbey in the Diocese of Norwich, mm -hmm. Norwich, Norwich in England, um, who's famous actually because its vicar is at war with its bishop and and is at war with the parish council and the bishop has told her to shape up and she says, no, you shape up, you're being mean. So on, there's a lower level spat over basically a dysfunctional woman uh, priest who is way over her head. Mm -hmm. um, one, but on her website, she's recently put out this thing about uh, peace and holiness in a tea tray. And she's offered this sort of little meditation thinking of a tea tray as an instrument for 
accessing the divine and spirituality. And I'm sure she means well. The problem is there's not much mention of Jesus Christ or what traditional Anglicans have looked at as they seek to find the divine. Yes, I know that people like uh, Julian of Norwich and uh, St. John of the Cross and all this really far advanced uh, aesthetical theologians don't necessarily speak and write on the same plane, but to get to a Julian of Norwich level, you've got to go through Jesus Christ and the Holy Tea Tray sort of skips all the Christianity bit and takes us straight to spirituality of the cozy comforter and the Holy Tea Tray and uh, the Holy Hand Grenade. The Holy Hand Grenade. The, the holy blanket of ore. Yes, I mean, it doesn't no, take long. You know, next we'll have the blessing of the comfy chair. Yes. Um, and the Spanish Inquisition will then rush in to end this segment. But um, there's just a, a ridiculousness about spirituality without Jesus. Because it just comes off as such a manufactured turn off i mean if if you were english if you were an average working class englishman or woman um this would be such a turn off i mean it would be such a sort of the triumph of the mid, middle class elites looking down at the man in the white van and well if you've taken and passed you know your basic church of england catechism you know that this person is a little off the rock rocker that the, the the sacrament the body and blood is is the holy is the uh the devout devo devotion not the not the chalice not not the yeah. container not the tea tray not not the hands of the tea tray not yeah not the stand you put the tea tray on i i'll <sighs> i'll say something's pretty strong and that spirituality that is devoid of the bible that is, is devoid of Jesus is an agent of Satan because it leads you to worship uh, the inner light of your own self which as fallen and corrupt human beings unless you're my wife you're not perfect um, and this spirituality absence of Christ and thinking on th things of material comfort and comfy memories and sort of bourgeois customs of respectability is alienating on a class level and it's theologically heretical because it does not preach the pure word of Christ as revealed in the Bible, not the editorial pages of the Guardian. If I'm not mistaken though, isn't the tea tray, you know, a tool of early colonial, colonial, colonialism? You know, I, I think we want to really remove that from our imagery. So, yeah, it is what it is. On to our next story. Uh, f this is the final story, then we'll talk about the uh, bishop ele uh, candidates for Pittsburgh. <sighs> this this is a this is a fun story because right now, well, it's it's not fun if you're if you you are Ukraine or a citizen of Ukraine because right now outside your border, uh, Russia has built up as of this morning 106, 107,000 troops. Their indication is we're going to invade Ukraine. Uh, our president here, uh, Biden says, don't do it, here's a couple things we'll do. Uh, if, you, if you do that, we'll withdraw our permission to give you a pipeline, we'll withdraw uh, support, we're pulling our diplomats out of the Ukraine already, we'll make sure China can't help you, but China doesn't care anyway. Uh, Europe is already dependent on the gas from Russia, so Europe is gonna kind of play a maybe, they shouldn't invade Ukraine type game. So we need somebody else to stand up and scare Putin from invading Ukraine. And I saw that Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, has decided to put his words, his power, his influence behind demands that Russia, Mr. Putin, stop this threat to the Ukraine. I'm like, well, that's, that's it. They're going to withdraw. Kevin, Kevin uh, there were two statements this week. One at the House of Lords by the Archbishop of Canterbury. That did it too. 
condemning uh, Russian uh, aggression in the Ukraine, and one by the Executive Council of the Episcopal Church condemning mm -hmm. Russian aggression in the in the Ukraine. And as an aside, I say the Ukraine rather than Ukraine, simply because that's how I was brought up and educated, and I studied Russian. Uh, in high school and all this and that and so i'm not making a political statement i'm just speaking unscriptedly Perhaps Ed, Ed, I would do the audience knows i don't have george's education so when i say ukraine i'm not doing it because i'm more superior than george he's just more educated no, no. my father just spent more money uh <laughs> to the same result uh for the same result here we are all those years later that being said uh, there were some really fascinating uh, uh, stories coming out of some of the defense-related publications this week where sources at the NSA are reporting that there is basically deep panic in the Kremlin. Uh, Vladimir Putin is wavering on whether or not to invade the Ukraine because the standing, the executive council of the Episcopal Church has said not to. Now, you remember in, uh, was it 2014? Catherine uh, Jeffrey I did did not Putin back down when Catherine Korea. Jeffrey Shorey, the presiding bishop, demanded that he withdraw from Korea. Am I right, Kevin, that he did pull out of Korea? Is I, I know he was probably a little bit more scared because she had just deposed 770 uh, clergy. So she probably had a little more clout, but that was it. <laughs> well, friends, we're being a little arch with that last comment, but... The Executive Council did pass a, a resolution condemning uh, Putin's aggression, but also saying we don't want to have any violence. We we call upon the U.S. government to exercise prudence, and uh, and we don't really want to see open warfare. So, um, I myself think this whole Ukraine thing is a, is a fiasco of our own making. And uh, you, you accommodate police, this is what you get. This is, this is a fiasco of our own weakness internationally. It's interesting yeah. because they're not accusing Putin of being a colonialist, which he is here. If he's going to invade a country and put uh, the Russian ethos into that country, he is being a colonialist in its purest definition. Uh, I really think uh, Putin's greatest desire is to reconstitute the Soviet Union. Uh, oh, absolutely. Any, you know, any way he can. He was very upset to, to see what happened under Mikhail Gorbachev. He was very upset to watch the country he loved, the Soviet Union, uh, implode after Mikhail Gorbachev and uh, uh, Boris Yeltsin uh, did what they did. And, you know, he was a member of the KGB, and he knows that the Soviet Union's greatest moments were the 1980s and the 1970s. Uh, but both Putin... Mikhail, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, Russian biographer, Russian Reagan biographers tell you the day that Ronald Reagan got the Pershing missile uh, to be permission to put that in Turkey was the day that uh, they could no longer fight uh, against America and they started to lose rapidly. It was 14 months after that that you saw the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union. And after that what? went the Berlin Wall. And the... Uh... I think the issue for me is that uh, the, the people in charge of American military and foreign policy are the people that gave us the Afghanistan debacle and the Iraq debacle. Absolutely. It's the same generals, the same planners, the same leaders. And we now have someone whom the Russians know that they can basically twiddle around their thumbs who will be fighting charges that he's only doing this because the Ukrainians paid his son X millions of dollars. And it's such a mess that this is something that I hope wiser heads prevail, but I don't see how it's going to happen. But I, I share the Episcopal Church's desire that Vladimir Putin not be aggressive. And I share their desire that we not go to war. Because I think war right now with America's massive social and economic and political problems is just another nail in our country's coffin. Our army We've is, messed up, but this yeah. is not the way to fix things. Our army, our military is not prepared for a war right now. Uh, we, we've certainly 
added some degrees of socialization to our army that it's no longer there to uh, kill and break things. It's there to serve um, the the gender happiness and the the sex happiness and the, the, the polity of the day. George, let's quickly mention um, there are three new candidates for Bishop of Pittsburgh. We'll talk about more of this on our Tuesday show. Um, cool. I know three of the names. Uh, friend, of Ang- <laughs> friend of Anglican TV, uh, Peter Frank is one of those. And um, uh, how Joel did... Scandrit, Joel Scandrit. Trinity Seminary. Yeah. And the third is Kirk Cameron, the uh, no. actor. Uh, <laughs> James Cameron. Let's see here. I, I'm looking for the list here. Uh, Alex Cameron. That's it, yeah. Here we go. Well, wasn't Kirk yes. Cameron? Oh, I, I'm... Yeah, I'm Kirk Cameron was back in the 80s. He became a Christian, and he's one of those evangelical guys. You, you, you kind of squint. Alex Cameron is president and CEO of the Isaiah 40 Foundation, Diocese of the Upper Midwest. Uh, we both know uh, Peter Frank. Reverend Peter Frank is the rector of Church of the Epiphany in Chantilly, Virginia. And Chantilly, uh, Rev- Chantilly. See, you have more education than I do. No, I just know the big <laughs> bopper song, Chantilly <laughs> Lane. <laughs> Uh, the Reverend Dr. Joel Scandrit, also a friend of Anglican TV, is an assistant pres- uh, professor of theology at Trinity School for Ministry, and he is an Angl- in the Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh. So we'll try and uh, talk more about that. We just wanted to let you know, yes, we got that story. It's up on Anglican.inc. I'll provide a link to that. Also in the show notes, please, we're closing out the program. Pray for George as he heals. He's, he's, you know, he's not just a co-host of Anglican Scripted. He runs one of the fastest growing churches in the diocese, if not the largest churches, certainly the highest church in the diocese. And we want him to be fully functioning at 110% when he sits down in front of the Anglican unscripted microphones. Pray for me as I leave the blizzard we call the blizzard of 20, the blizzard of the century so far uh, for 2022 here and fly back to 81 degrees in Bushnell, Florida. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode number 714 of Anglican Unscripted.